What's your name? Hey, I'm Haley. This is my sister Haley. Um, we just finished our interview with Eric Oster. Well, my interview. <laughs> Haley was here for support. I need to smoke some CBD to calm down because I'm going crazy. It's prescribed. You want to talk first? Sure. Um, we're just talking about how the interview went and how Madison's feeling. And um, we started with a big hug and um, and Madison just like being happy, I think, relieved. Yeah. Um, a little bit of memory loss. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm really glad I recorded it because yeah. I don't remember a lot. Um, mm -hmm. That happens when I get very passionate about something. I'll just like, you got all of my attention and my memory has no attention. <laughs> so we're probably going to rewatch that too. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but, Make some notes maybe so we can um, yeah. touch on things further, uh, maybe in therapy. Um, and any questions yeah. I have for him, I can follow up to. So how do you think Eric was? I think he was um, really good at what he was doing. Obviously, he had to be very sensitive. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, considering he only thought it was the one incident and I told him everything, like he handled it pretty well. I don't know how long he was expecting the interview to be, but yeah, like I don't think he was an expecting an hour. <laughs> um, I think thirty minutes is average for yeah. interviews, so I think he was maybe overwhelmed. Maybe <laughs> there's just a, like so many things that happened that it's like it's not just one thing; it's it's like a lot of fuckery, and yeah. <laughs> you gotta explain everything in order to understand everything, and like that's probably why people don't believe me because it's a lot. It is a lot. It's a lot. Um, but I talked to a reporter today. I've never done that in my life. For the first time. Ever. Um, was it hard? The build-up was hard. The yeah. anticipation for, like, the anticipation yeah. up until the actual, like, phone was ringing was really hard. <laughs> what about when you were actually talking to him? Do you, felt, do you feel like, other than the fact, it was kind of hard to hear him. But yeah, like, it was a little hard. Um, I felt okay at times um i definitely valued every time you held my hand because it's like definitely calm me down i was sh a little it. shaky um i don't think i was emotionally available during the talk just because like i knew that it would be triggering if i was emotionally available um this happened to me seven years ago so it's also not that um it's I'm triggering, sure. obviously, and obviously it's super traumatic for me, but talking about it has gotten easier because I've reported it to police, they're taking it seriously, people believe me, people were there, people saw it happen, and I know it's true. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to talk about it, but not about everything, and like, I don't know what will come of this. Um, I hope that it doesn't happen to anyone else. And I hope that Craig doesn't teach kids. Sorry, it's the truth. Not sorry. I really hope you don't teach kids, period. You don't deserve that. You need a criminal background check and you need to be trained on how to teach children, period. Mm -hmm. um, if you are a advertiser and you are working with somebody under the age of 18, you should have a criminal background check, whether that's a client or talent you have to, like, period. I don't mm -hmm. know why it's not a thing in advertising. Um, and if it is a thing, it would probably eliminate a lot of advertisers. So maybe we should do that first. Just saying, um, keep the kids safe. I know that, like, when I was three, I was brought to a commercial set and put in a diaper and angel wings and sat on a mattress and was photographed for a diaper commercial. And I don't know if any of those people had police background checks, but I was a naked baby and my mom was there mm -hmm. and uh, that was the 90s. So has anything really changed? Um, from my experience working in the industry, nope. Um, I worked with a seven-year-old girl as a hand model. I was not trained to work with kids. I was never taught in school how to work with kids. 
never taught how to work with talent. I was never trained by my bosses how to work with talent. And I was never told that I would be alone with this child. Um, their parent left the room. My creative director wasn't around. It was me and the photographer and a kid. And I was art directing her. And I was responsible for her safety at that point. And that's a huge deal for me. Um, and I did not feel comfortable with that at all. And I really don't understand why that's normal. Um, like that kid and that mom probably came to that room thinking that we were good people. Um, that I was fully trained on how to work with kids. That I knew exactly what I was doing. And that I wasn't a bad influence on her kid. And thankfully I'm not. Thankfully I'm a good person. And I, I cared more about what that kid saw in that room than I did about what we were doing that day. Um, it was intense. Like I didn't enjoy mentoring students at Anomaly because they were at risk of being hurt there. Um, I hate that like my mentee has to ask her fellow graduates and past students if they were ever hurt there. Um, and I'm really thankful that she was not. Um, I don't know if that's because I was constantly beside her. Um, but I watched her like a hawk. I would not let her be alone with anybody I deemed predatory, in my opinion, while I worked there. And one-on-ones with uh, students was very popular amongst Anomaly and still is today. I know that that's probably a really terrible idea because when you put at-risk youth in rooms with uh, toxic people, surround them by alcohol, bad things happen. I don't really understand why you think that would be a good thing for kids to do. Yeah. Yeah. They're not really learning much about life other than the fact that, well, you got away with everything. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it like creates a generation, like for the boys that were in that program, I'm sure now they might be struggling with things that um, the men that hurt you and other women at your industry are dealing with now and they might start to behave that way because they've seen it normalized in an agency Absolutely. which is really scary for the next generation yeah of women and other men and it includes students at ad schools too um i think the miami ad school in toronto is uh i don't know i think there needs to be a lot more oversight on the teachers um a lot more oversight on the speakers I know that a lot of the speakers are not very good influences on kids. They're addicts, they're alcoholics, they're sexual assault people. Like, they abused me, so, like, if they can abuse me as an adult, then it makes it a lot easier to abuse a child, in my opinion. Um, they're vulnerable. They don't know any better, and you're their superior. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this ad school is feeding into the agency that Craig McIntosh actually works at too, is also super sketchy. Um, yeah. That's, that's really pretty, gross, in my pretty opinion. pretty like, horrible coincidence, if it yeah. is, because that's ridiculous. That's like grooming 101, if that's the, the case. And I think that me telling the school about what is happening with him and them being aware is the first step, but them making action is the second step. And every teacher that works at, like, it, it doesn't matter if you're a professional and you teach, you should have a police background check done, period. If you're around children, more than for your job, like, you need to, to have that. Like, I had one done because I was a big sister, big brother programmer. Like, I've mm -hmm. always had that done. I've been with Kids Help Phone. I've volunteered. So, like, every year I've had to have a police background check and I've worked with kids. And I know what that process is like you have to pay for it and you have to go through that on your own and nobody does that mm -hmm. ever yeah I think agencies if agencies were to start um, requiring that upon hire or even for current employees just signing a declaration that like states that they haven't done anything um, mm -hmm. and if something's found out then they're immediately let go and that also makes it more um, like easier to um, come out about these types of things because now you know something's going to get done about it, yeah. not 
well, if they don't do anything about it, then I'm going to be embarrassed. Or, yeah, or lose my career. Or lose your career. Like I did. Um, but, like, there's a big lesson to be learned here. And um, luckily yeah. Madison has the ability to make some change. And, um, yeah. We're trying. We're excited um, about that. We are uh, hopeful. We're excited about the future. Um, we're scared to death that this is happening to other people. Um, breaks my heart to think about it. I don't think about it. Um, try not to. Because yeah. I can't control that. I can only control what I can, I'm capable of, and that's myself. And I can only worry about me right now and what's going on with this investigation. And um, so far, so good. Um, Craig McIntosh is being investigated for sexual assault. And Jesse Hornstein Goldberg is being investigated for rape. And I believe that's really good news because that validates my experiences and then after that's dealt with there will be a civil yeah for sure but we definitely don't have to think about that right now nope nope um yeah <laughs> we'll wait for uh, one day but not today we'll wait for somebody to call us <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're doing we need a yeah. vacation after this yeah we'll take some time off this has been too much but, um, um, I think I, this uh, this experience has turned a lot of people's heads in um, in your direction and in the people who have hurt you's direction. Um, so even if they if something happens where they can change, that's honestly like the least of the impact. Mm -hmm. um, so the impact could be so much greater, and um, it could be ideally, as small as creating internal groups at your agency for self help. Yeah, for like or, connecting. Having an open HR person available to talk with that you don't have to go through a manager yeah. or um, anyone else to get to. Um, like, make sure your HR person is well known in your office. Like, they should be mingling with all the staff and, mm -hmm. like, be very approachable. And yes. I notice the differences between someone who's good and healthy and having fun and and all of that and someone who's withdrawn and sad and and if you notice people life, that are like big changes overindulging you know? and that could be alcohol that could be drugs that could be caffeination that could be smoking like it's okay to ask them if they are okay and mm -hmm. to go out of your way to make sure that your coworker is okay because it's a very human thing to do and I get that not doing that means that you don't have to worry about them. However, by not worrying about your team, you show them that nobody cares about them. And they're never going to talk to you about what's going on because they know you don't care. And, mm -hmm. like, for me, there wasn't an HR department. So, like, obviously I felt like nobody cared. Um, and nobody did. So... Unfortunately, that was my truth. I don't know if that's the reality today, but I can't say that it's far off. Um, it's not been that long, and I know a lot of people who still work, still work in the industry, and not much is ever changing. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, yeah, it's messy. But we're trying to clean it up. So back to the interview. Um... <laughs> Um, what do you want to know? Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask him? No. Um, how do you feel about getting those things now public? Um, so now they're in like the hands of like a reporter. Um, it's like a weight lift job, my shoulders. And we filmed it, <laughs> so like you can watch that over and over again and like add to it because I'm yeah. sure you blacked out during part of I that. Can't. Yeah. Um, and like have a positive experience and you know what like maybe approach it more emotionally and be able to get triggered and use your coping mechanisms that we've been working on um, yeah, and do some exposure on. therapy yeah and it doesn't have to be the whole video you can just watch 10 minutes or as I much as you earlier can too with my part 2 video I was watching yeah. that just to get like an idea of like okay he's probably seen these like he has an idea I need a refresher because I've put it out of my mind for so long it's been like what, almost yeah. a month since my last upload yeah so um and like that's for a lot of reasons like um obviously we're not getting into why I haven't uploaded because I'm not a youtuber <laughs> 
I'm just a person. <laughs> sharing their story. Yeah, I'm just sharing when I can. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to make a living off of this, and I will never monetize anything. Trust me. Screw that. Um, and that's just personal based on my experience in the advertising industry. You know, you're not going to monetize my experiences um, on YouTube at all. Like, I don't need that. I don't need those views um, or that that income. I just don't. Um, I would rather people find it organically and not find it through an advertisement in which harms people, um, whether that be like any ad. Like, right, I personally don't believe people need things that they don't need. And when it comes to stupid ads on YouTube, like, yeah, you don't need that shit. And, um, you don't need to add monetization to your videos, like, just because they say it's an option. Same with Facebook. Like, they keep pushing, like, oh, boost, promote, whatever, but you don't have to. Um, you can ignore it. And it sucks that it's pushed down your throat so much, but... You don't have to. Like, you can not advertise. You can choose to just exist in a world that's your content and nobody has any sticky fingers in it. And you're not making money and they're not making money and it's just what it is. And that's okay. Um, it's okay to make money in different ways and it's okay to have this as a hobby and say that this is just a hobby and that it's not a career because eventually like making videos for money isn't gonna last um advertisers change people change societies and communities change all the time so banking on the fact that you might have ads for the rest of your youtube careers is not a long-term goal in my opinion that's sustainable and i really hope that a lot of people take that seriously and think about their future when it comes to that because it's probably going to change it's pretty, pretty out there with the amount of ads and ad blockers and VPNs. Um, so, I mean, advertising is whittling their way into every type of media because commercials aren't really that important anymore. Like, I don't remember the last time they I don't. watched the Super Bowl commercials. Like, they're pointless and they're costing how much money? <laughs> People just watch them on YouTube for free anyway. Is stupid and they, that's what you teach in school like oh make this print ad like, why <laughs> don't have to <laughs> not necessary like you don't need to do an out-of-home campaign because like it's probably not gonna be out of home like you're probably just gonna be online yo imagine like all the companies that are profiting off of just like COVID-19 advertising that's what I'm saying like ridiculous the, Ridiculous. The like, advertising going around. Turning every... this pandemic into a financial gain. Yeah. When so many people are unemployed and living like paycheck to paycheck and these people are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. Like, ridiculous. It is. It's stupid. And, like, their employees are the ones who suffer. Like, I don't know if you guys heard about Kraft Dinner, but, like because it's a non-perishable, like the Montreal plant was like upping their their whole production. And to be honest with you, it's fucking macaroni and cheese, guys. Like you can make that at home. You don't need to buy it in a box. And the person that was saying, like the CEO or whoever was like, yeah, like this is a necessity. We should have skids of craft dinner in the middle of the grocery aisle. We should be making more and more and more and shoving this down their throat. Like this is a huge opportunity for craft dinner to make tons of money, you guys. Fuck you, craft dinner. You're an asshole. And like, like what the hell happened to your employees during that time? Did you consider Bad that? Bad job, craft dinner. Bad job. Bad. Bad KD. Ain't nobody ever gonna eat that shit no more. Mm -hmm. I think we're done. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. We're done. Yeah, uh, we're done. We're done. I think we're done. We're done. We're done. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.